fight back against Joseph Kony, who was abducting trial soldiers, who is abducting trial soldiers in Uganda, in the United States, a lot of the Occupy movement, and so forth. Um, we're also seeing you know, governments react to the internet. Uh, in Indiana, it became the first state recently to, to allow people to vote, and Estonia's held electronic elections. Um, and uh, there, there's many ways. I hear in Greece, for example, there's an open data movement uh, that would allow uh, companies and individuals, NGOs, to have access to government data from subway times to government records. And that's something that people we really are working very hard for. Uh, and we applaud the Greek government for creating an open data platform. But at the same time, I mean, we do, as many speakers have recognized, see the limits of the internet. Um, one of the first things I covered as a journalist was the collapse of communism from Poland, Czechoslovakia, then Czechoslovakia, before it became split into the Czech Republic and Slovakia, Hungary, and there was no internet. So we talked about the 1973 student uh, revolts here in, in Greece, and there was no internet. Um, in Poland, Solidarity, a labor movement, had 15 million members within a month of its creation, and its main organizing tool was the church, or its space the church, or the factory. So the basic needs of what people want to achieve through politics do not change. But the internet allows them to participate perhaps even more uh, effectively and allows each of us uh, more easily to, to participate. Um, now, the other big topic that I'm dealing with, and that I think it needs to be raised today, is where's the state of that new freedom that everyone has to talk, to, to speak, to write, and publish. What we see around the world is a growing trend towards nothing less than censorship. Um, we, there was a recent study by the Open Net Initiative. It studied 75 countries, and it found that in those 75, of those 75 countries, some 40 of them uh, censored, filtered, or blocked. Now, at Google, uh, what we work in about 150 countries, and in any one moment, we would say it changes every day, that our products would be blocked uh, in 25 of them. It can be YouTube uh, blocked in Pakistan. For example, it can be bought in China, in Iran, in North Korea. Um, it can be Google Docs, which people don't like because they're, you can share information on them. It can be Blogger, because there's a blog that uh, uh, is offensive to some parts of the population or the government. Um, and of course, there's our experience at Google in China, where we saw the steady and measurable increase in censorship in every which way on the internet that ultimately led us to leave the country and stop giving searches, uh, leave uh, to Hong Kong and only open searches to Hong Kong where there was freedom to do so. So that is, um, for us, a growing, growing problem. Um, this type of pressure on the internet can take place in many ways and in many places. Um, one of the places is the UN system. So we see the internet as being built in 20 short years, since I was a journalist in Paris, to now where all of you are tweeting from a bottom-up, market-driven system that brought together private business, NGO, civil society, and government. And no one had a veto, and it was powered uh, by the force of everyone working, in a sense, together, uh, given by the incentives of the internet to share, create, uh, and so forth. But if we look around the world, we see countries like Russia, China, and the Arab states who would like to change that and put a government-controlled system of internet governance. And the latest manifestation of that was a summit in Dubai last December of the International Telecommunications Union. Um, what we saw there was that the world was split. 55 countries uh, said no to the Russian, Chinese, and Arab proposals to change the way the internet is governed. Um, but 80 plus said yes. 
And um, I, I, again, I'm going to applaud Greece. Europe really did stand firm in rejecting the, the proposals of the Russian, Arab, and um, the Chinese delegates. And the Greek government stood up to that pressure and, and stayed with its European allies to refuse the sign of fraud deal. We would like to see that position to stay. And Greece to use its influence at the presidency to keep that. Um, this, the pressure that I talked to you about on the internet isn't just from the usual suspects side of it. It isn't just you know, North Korea, Iran, and so forth. It's also in democracies. And some of the biggest challenges we see are in democracies such as India and Brazil. Now, our country president was recently arrested in Brazil over a video on YouTube that we would consider just legitimate political speech. India puts a lot of uh, more protection, or uses to protect, web platforms for the material that is put up on them, increasing their liability, and putting pressure on them to, to filter or block speech. And even here in Europe, I, mean, I spent a lot of time talking about the right to be forgotten, and we did talk about the balance between privacy and free expression in some of the speakers earlier, um, but Google faces a series of cases, one before the European Court uh, uh, of Justice in Luxembourg, on exactly that, that the, that the right to be forgotten should be turned into something about the right uh, to rewrite history, and that we need to remember also the right to remember. So for us, this is very important that we don't have to uh, stop working with legitimate information from new searches, or build a censorship machine to, to, because people don't like what they find when they search the internet. What are we doing to promote internet freedom and digital participation? So our, our default position is to let information flow. And the first thing we do is transparency. And this is becoming more and more a key theme in the wake of, wake of recent revelations. So four years ago, before, before any other companies, we started producing a transparency report where we wanted to be transparent and we told about all the requests, the requests that we received from governments to take down information uh, and uh, or uh, give over information on users. And we've been publishing it ever since. We Google, Google Transparency Report. And uh, you'll see it's, it's updated every six months. We'll update it fairly soon. Um, and it goes country by country uh, with uh, details on the amount of requests we receive to take down content or hand over information on users. Um, what we are seeing is that uh, there's a, a dramatic rise in those requests over time. Uh, I think that they've more than doubled over the last couple of years. And then we, we, going back to what I said earlier, many of the requests were coming in places like uh, in democracies, Brazil and India, for example. Um, in Brazil, uh, for example, we got 4,000 requests for data uh, over the last uh, year or so. Um, and obviously, also this transparency report is uh, flawed because it didn't include all the information about the recent American government surveillance. And we're now suing the American government to allow us to publish that because we feel that only by showing the numbers will people understand what is going on. And we try to make as many details as possible without um, compromising national security or breaking the law. But unfortunately, at this point, the law in America does not allow us to publish those figures. So how do we show this? Uh, we also do on the transparency report keep a, a law of where the internet it's under pressure, where it's being cut, where it's being uh, uh, interrupted. And if you look at the graph there, you see uh, the first part shows Egypt, and then in the middle of the al Square uh, revolution uh, protest, there's a dramatic drop, because that's where the Egyptian government actually cut access for more than a day to the internet. Uh, the entire web was shut down. And in the bottom, you can also see the same sort of uh, dramatic because that's a Pakistani graph, a uh, graph of YouTube in Pakistan, where over um, everyone from Mohammed Day, uh, all the 
traffic on the people's cut, and it's been recut ever since uh, because of the innocence of Muslim video. So another thing that we are doing at Google is trying to work together with civil society and other companies to prevent a rush to the body. Uh, the Global Network Initiative was set up bringing together academics, companies, uh, and NGOs uh, to set common rules on how we deal with government requests for information. Um, it was set up in the wake of what happens in China, where one company handed over information on dissidents who were emailed, uh, and where these dissidents were then arrested and thrown into jail. Um, at first, for the first three years of its existence, it really wasn't a global network initiative. It was more the American network initiative, since only American companies and American uh, NGOs were, were engaged. And one of the things I've been working on over the last three years is attempting to get more European participation. And recently, European NGOs Index on Censorship has joined, and we started a dialogue with the European telephone companies to see if we can work together to find limits or at least common rules on how we deal with government pressure to, to uh, police the internet. Okay. Throughout many Europeans, many countries in Europe are supportive of much of what I've said, supportive of internet freedom. In Dubai, Europe stood up and rejected the Russian narrow proposal. Um, the biggest support has come from Sweden, uh, Swedish Foreign Minister Carl Bildt, and he's someone who really does also use the internet to communicate in a, in a very effective way. He has more than 150,000 followers on Twitter. So, and here we'll see, he's also been instrumental in founding something called Freedom Online, which brings together about 20 countries across the globe dedicated to protecting internet freedom. And Neil Bruce, who I think you'll be dealing with a lot for your digital summit and in the new presidency, has also been a big, big supporter of keeping the internet free. Um, what I would like to say in conclusion is I hope if I ever come back here next year that I can add a slide and have a Greek politician uh, standing up for the same sort of values in the Greek presidency uh, being quoted in a similar fashion. Thank you very much. Hopefully we'll stay over a little, a little hours to have a little chat.